Thanks for tuning into our message at Coastal Christian Ocean City. For more info on anything going on here, you can visit our website at ccoceancity.com or check out our app in the App Store or Google Play. Today, Matthew will be bringing the message. So without further ado, here's Matthew. The book of 1 John, chapter 2. It is a necessary guide for those who say they love him, to look like him. We are reflections, a mirror of Christ. And just as Christ was, we too are called to be in the world, but not of the world. For if anyone loves this world, then they cannot love the Father, because in the darkness of this world, true light is already shining. God is light, and if we know God, then we must walk in the light and keep his commandments. But there is a strange beauty to it, and the beauty is that we cannot do it on our own. Eventually, no matter how hard we try, we all will sin, and we all fall short. But we have an advocate. His name is Jesus Christ. He is our Savior and the propitiation for our sins. Not only for our sins, but for the sins of the entire world. So we are in the book of 1 John, excited to actually bring chapter 2 to a close with two verses. I'm going to read those verses up front, then I'm going to do a review with where we've been. Maybe you're joining us for the first time and we say, welcome. We don't want you to feel lost. I'll do my very best to bring you into the space according to 1 John. If you don't have a Bible, there is one in the seat in front of you. Grab it. Turn to the back of the Bible. We're in this first epistle written by the disciple John, the youngest of the 12. He writes not only the gospel according to John, he writes the first, second, and third epistles, which are letters to the general church, this church near Ephesus where he pastored as an elder, and he also wrote the book that is titled Revelation. It's not the revelation of John, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to John. So where we're at in the text, I'm gonna read the final two verses that we'll get into tonight and then work my way backwards. 1 John chapter 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him. This is a common word that John uses continually. He uses it over and over. It means to abide, to stay in, to continue at three R's, to rest, to remain, and be rooted in. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Abide in me, stay connected to me, have communion with me. Remember, it's not just a one and done decision that you may have made at some point in your spiritual journey. Maybe as a kid at a camp, you said, I made a decision to choose Jesus. But since then, how has your spiritual journey developed? In other words, abiding is not about a one and done decision, it's about a daily interaction and commitment. He says, abide in Christ. And when he appears, you ready for this? When he returns, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So the previous section, John introduced a word in Christendom that is so misused, so abused. Look at me. It's the word anointing. It is krishma in Greek. It means Holy Spirit, that's all it means. God has deposited within the believer his Holy Spirit. So look at me. I am not more anointed than you are. This is me deploying my God-given gift as the Holy Spirit is able to move in me and through me. Now that translates differently and more personally in your life where you are just as anointed. If you chose Jesus, the common property of every believer globally is the Holy Spirit, anointed. Now, the Holy Spirit, as we discovered last Thursday, has a role to play, a very big role. We know the Holy Spirit as the comforter, the spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit consoles, counsels, according to the word of God. The Holy Spirit comforts when I'm going through a tragedy. The Holy Spirit is that blanket, maybe, of hope. But the Holy Spirit also has a teaching ministry, the Holy Spirit brings illumination to revelation. There's no new revelation. God's final revelation was his son, Jesus. Jesus is the word, and here is the word of God. We see Jesus, the word, in the flesh. We read the word in the Bible. And the Holy Spirit brings illumination. When I read something that I might have scanned over in times past, and it jumps out at me. You ever had that? And you go, I didn't see it that way. Well, that's the Holy Spirit bringing illumination to his revelation. The Holy Spirit also within the believer is a protective agent of influence. What do I mean by that? 
Last Thursday's message was titled, The Protection of Abiding. So the Holy Spirit within me gives me discretion and discernment to know the difference between lies and truth. Now, why do people get caught up with false teachers? Because they don't know the scriptures. Because they don't know the word. And remember, the Holy Spirit is energized by the word. The more word I consume, but not just memorize, look at me, actualize. Because you can memorize verses and they all sound good as they come out verbally, but how are they being applied practically? So the word of God in my mind makes its way to my heart and then the Holy Spirit gets more access to what I call the home of my heart. Remember, the anointing of God on all of us is common property. The problem is a lot of believers are pursuing more of the Holy Spirit. And in the process, they get caught up in spiritual frenzies, spiritual goosebumps, and then they might look at you and say, have you had this spiritual experience? And you go, no, I haven't. And then they might consider that you're not as spiritual as they are. That's not how this works, church. What happens is I'm not after more of the Holy Spirit. He's after more of me. I give him more of me, more of my fleshly tendencies, my carnal mind. I give that over. I give in to his conviction. Conviction is healthy. Conviction will have a believer standing firm against temptation and a culture that is trying to get us to bow down. But with conviction, I'm not bowing down to the world around me. In fact, conviction says, in spite of consequences, I will only bow down to the heavens above me. This week, the Holy Spirit, the anointing, the message titled, the projection of abiding. Because if I'm connected to God and his word through Jesus Christ, I'm going to project two things, confidence and character. Confidence and character. Now, if you consider, the enemy's tactic early on was, of course, persecution. The early disciples, the early church, they were assaulted physically. The persecution and the opposition against the early church was relentless. I mean, just study church history. But here's what happened. Every time the enemy's tactic of persecution came at the church, God used it, turned it against the enemy, and spread out the movement. So this is what I consider the greatest threat against the church or Christian is not persecution. The greatest threat is spiritual deception. Because you know what the enemy did after he realized persecution's not working? In fact, I digress. Most other countries, whether they're allowed access to the word of God or not, that have heavy persecution, if you call yourself a Christian, they actually pray that the Americas, the United States of America, would receive persecution because of our complacency. They're praying that we would be persecuted and we're praying that they would stop being persecuted. So what did the enemy do? I'll tell you what he did, he joined the church. He walked right in the doors and he sat down in the assembly and he began to influence with spiritual deception from the inside out. Oh, that is the most dangerous threat against the Christian. See, not knowing the word of God, lacking spiritual devotion to the scriptures, lacking biblical devotion will inevitably give way to spiritual deception. Paul would write to his protege, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 1, verse 13 and 14. He says, Timothy, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me. Notice, Paul holding fast to the sound teaching of the word of God, the scriptures, he's now passing it off to Timothy and saying, hold fast, sound words, sound teaching. And then he says, in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus, because that's where you find it, that good thing which was committed to you, ready? Keep it by the Holy Spirit who dwells you. There it is. See how this all ties again? The protection of the abiding, the anointing, the Holy Spirit in you. The projection of abiding, if I'm connected to Christ, I'm gonna project confidence and I'm gonna project righteous character. Same epistle written by Paul to Timothy. It's gonna be on the screens for you. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. You ready? This is not just a pastor's Bible verse. Be diligent 
to show yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be put ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, of course, this is my responsibility. As a minister of the gospel, this verse is my responsibility to rightly divide the word of truth. But it's not just for a pastor. It's for every Christian and every believer. Now, when it says be diligent, it means to be enthusiastic, to be zealous, to be ambitious, to be motivated. Do you have a motivation to present yourself approved, tried to God? What does that mean? It means a majority of human nature is more concerned about getting people's approval over God's approval. Now, what would happen if I was to care more about what you thought than what God thought? What type of messages would I actually communicate to the congregation? If I cared about how you felt, your feelings, that made sure you always were comfortable, that you felt good, I'd want your approval. But I'm not in this for your approval, church. Oh, I appreciate the encouragement and the affirmation, but according to that verse, I need to be diligent to present myself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. In other words, after the work is finished, if it's done with integrity, it's done honestly, then there's no reason to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The minister and the Christian is not in this to be successful. We're in this to be faithful. We're not running for a popularity contest. We're living by integrity. So here we have rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly dividing or rightly handling. The imagery is wielding a sword. You do so with skill. You rightly divide, you handle the sword with skill. It also means to plow straight. A farmer would go out and he would plow his fields straight. That means that I am to make sure that I'm always, listen, telling it straight. Hey, shoot it to me straight, we say, right? Tell it to me straight. Oh, if more pastors and ministers would just tell it straight. It also means to arrange properly, to dissect like a priest would fillet a sacrifice and arrange it appropriately and properly on the altar. It also means the final meeting to allot each person their portion. When you would go to a host's house and he had a meal prepared, he would allot each person their personal portion. And he would make sure, and this is remarkable, that his, the portion he gave was catered perfectly to the individual that he was feeding. Now, in prison, spend some time in prison. If this is your first time hearing that at Coastal Christian, we say, welcome to Coastal Christian. Come as you are. But I ran a Bible study. And guys that would come to that Bible study weren't so educated. They would tell you that. Matt, I didn't go to school. I can't read. Now, imagine if I led the Bible study and got all theological on them. What do you think they would take away from that? The portions I decided to rightly divide for these men, I made sure that they could understand it. So what I used was Jesus' parables because he brought down these stories from heaven and they had earthly meaning. I dealt with one of my tier mates. His name was Little John. You guys know him. I talk about him often. He's a former mob enforcer for the, a crime family in New York City. How'd I deal with him? I said, John, sit down. Hey, man, um, you know how you kind of serve like the Godfather? Yeah. Okay, well, we're serving God the Father. And you know how he said, I'm going to make you an offer that you can't refuse? <laughs> yeah, God the Father kind of said that first when he gave us his son Jesus. And the light bulb would go off because I was able to give the portion to little John so he could understand it. How do I know that? Because I'm reading his book, which is almost done, and I'm able to read his thoughts from that time where he's actually referencing me, which I'm humbled to read, as his accountability shepherd in the way I was able to teach the word of God to these men. So I said, wow, that is so awesome. I'm writing a message on rightly dividing the word of truth. Now here's where we get caught up. We say, well, that's just the way you interpret the Bible. Pastor, or that's not the way I interpret it. Oh, that's your interpretation. You ever heard that one? Oh, don't, don't use that Bible verse on me. That's your interpretation. Look at me. It's not your interpretation. It's not my interpretation. It's God's interpretation. It's God's interpretation for us. 
So I need to know what the Bible says. I need to get into the word of God to understand. Listen, context, what am I asking you to do? I'm asking you to maybe get a hold of a good commentary. Get a hold of a good Bible study program that can help you understand what it is you're reading. That's practical. Join a Bible study where somebody is teaching it, not just at church. This cannot be the only time we're together eating from God's word. This is great and grand. This is, a, this is prescribed in the scriptures that we would not forsake the assembling of ourselves together to do several things, to stir one another up unto love and good works and to understand what it is God has for us today. But this can't be enough. So get a good commentary, that's my recommendation, to help explain some of the texts that you're reading. Get a good devotional and spend time in it, and you'll learn it's God's interpretation. The Bible is the best interpreter of the Bible. The Bible will confirm and affirm from the old to the new. The Bible will rightly divide itself, and the minister is simply to be open to it. It's not my interpretation. Recently, I made a post on social media I guess you can call it a sensitive issue. Interestingly, this sensitive issue wasn't sensitive only a couple hundred years ago. But the fact that the culture has energized it and called it a sensitive political issue, but political, ethical, moral, they're all biblical when you really boil it down. And here's what I received. Two comments from two different people, both of them I know. One of them's a professed, I chose that word intentionally, Christian. The other one is a professed atheist. Both of them, not knowing each other, told me not to judge in my post. What'd they do? They used the scriptures against me, but I know the scriptures. The Bible verse that even a non believer will use against you Matthew chapter 7 Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you'll be judged. Sounds scary, right? And the measure you use will be used. But the Bible interprets it. It means don't judge hypocritically, but the believer's supposed to judge. Wanna know why? That translation means don't judge unless you're willing to be judged by the same standard. Don't judge unless you're willing to be judged by the same standard, which means when I call things out as a minister of truth, though the culture might say that's judgmental, the Bible is the standard, and I'm willing to be judged by the same standard. But here's what happens. When I don't know the Bible's interpretation, I shrink away from the truth, and I find myself neutralized and on the sideline. What am I saying? I'm saying we got to know the word of God. We must understand the word of truth given to us by God in truth, which is a perfect picture and prophecy of his son Jesus in the Old Testament and the person of Jesus in the New Testament. He is the way, the truth, the life. And then we have access to the Holy Spirit, which helps us dictate and discern with the spirit of truth. Ultimately, it all comes back to truth. This quote from C.S. Lewis, remarkable. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. There's an edited version of this quote. It says, I believe in Christ as I believe in the sun. Even though I can't look into the sun, I know the sun and its existence allows me to see everything else. Well, how does that translate for the believer? I must be looking for Jesus, not only as I study the scriptures, I must be looking for Jesus revealing himself to me in my life. But since we're talking about the word of God, Jesus is all through the text. Genesis to Revelation, two Thursdays ago, I took us through every book of the Old Testament and I showed you that it all pointed to Jesus Christ, a picture. Tonight, we're gonna spend a little bit of time in Psalm 22, Psalm 23, and Psalm 24, and you'll understand why in a second. Where is Jesus Christ in Psalm 22, Psalm 23, and Psalm 24? If you were to read the first verse in Psalm 22, 
you will read a quote. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is what Jesus said on the cross. He was cluing anybody in at that scene that he is quoting a psalm, a prophecy that David wrote hundreds of years earlier, alluding to something that didn't exist called crucifixion. Such verses that, that tell us this is about Jesus on the cross. Verse seven, all those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted in the Lord. Let him rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. Didn't they say that to Jesus? Yes. Can't God rescue you? Verse 16, dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. What was David talking about? Hundreds of years before crucifixion existed, David writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I count all my bones. We know not a single bone of Jesus was broken. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Verse 21, you have answered me. And then the rest of Psalm 22 is an explosion of praise. And I go, wait, how is that connected to the cross? Well, it's the cross and the tomb. And the cross, which gave way to Jesus saying, it is finished, and then three days later, rose from the dead, and his name would be renowned. I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will praise you. All the way to verse 31 in Psalm 22, where it finally says that he has done this. It is the Hebrew word, asa, which is the word finished. It is finished. What's the point? The point is, in Psalm 22, we see Jesus giving up his life for us. In Psalm 23... We see Jesus leading us in our life. It's the language that is present active. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me, present. He restores me, present. I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it's present. He gives up his life in Psalm 22. He leads me in my life in Psalm 23. And in Psalm 24, it talks about the return of the king, how he's coming back Psalm 24, lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, everlasting doors. The king of glory shall come in. It's using gates as humans to look up. And then finally, we connect this to 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, which is exactly where we're at in John. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, when he comes back, we may have confidence, there's the first word, and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Well, here's the question. How do you have confidence at his coming? How do you not fall into the camp of being ashamed, which means to shrink away? The answer is in Psalm 24. Again, verse three and four, I'll read it. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy presence, in his holy place? Here's the answer. He who has clean hands, external action, and a pure heart, internal attitude, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. Are you catching that? Who can stand God's presence? Who can be confident knowing he could return any second? The person that has clean hands, external in our action, and a pure heart. That's my internal attitude. This is the same thing John would write in chapter three that we'll eventually get to. He said, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. What hope? The hope that he's coming back. Here's the translation. If Jesus was about to come into your house at any second, what would he catch you doing? If Jesus was to walk into your bedroom, what would he find you doing? If Jesus showed up when you're out and about with your friends, what would he happen upon. Now, if I live with an awareness of his thereness that he's coming back for me, isn't that the greatest motivator to stay pure in a filthy world? Amen. To watch my thoughts, to guard my heart, to be pure. Because purity, integrity, they all translate to character. The character of the Christian 
So to have confidence before the Lord, it's not based on pious performance. Confidence before the Lord is based on a pure conscience. Pious performance, just because a minister's wearing a long robe and might bellow out reading the scriptures with a dynamic voice, just because it might look good externally, religiously, doesn't mean that it's good in the conscience individually. The scandals that go on in faith groups globally, some denominations more than others, sexual immorality, pedophilia, don't judge. Oh, I'm willing to be judged by that standard. Don't be fooled by pious performance. What God is after is a pure conscience. See, the word of God, it calls us to the cross. And the cross is where we meet our sin. And when I see my sin, and look, I realize the Savior is taking it, and he takes it from me, and then my conscience comes alive again. And the things that I used to do, the things I used to say, the person I used to be, there's now this conviction that sets in. It's guilt, and I talk about this often. Guilt is healthy. The moment I do something that's wrong, I should feel guilty, and I accept that guilt, and the guilt should get me to drive further into grace. And when I go back to the cross, God goes, oh, I forgive you again, and here's new mercies for you again, and I delight in mercy. Confidence before the Lord, pure conscience. Pure conscience is having an acute awareness of your lostness without Jesus. An acute awareness of your brokenness without Jesus. Finally, in Psalm 24, verse 5, he shall receive blessing from the Lord. That's you. You shall receive blessing from the Lord, ready, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. In other words, the one that gives us righteousness, that's God. How does that translate in our First John study? I'm glad you asked. It's verse 29. If you know he is righteous, translation, since he is righteous. That means since he is righteous, since you know he is righteous. Can I translate that to the common language of English? Since you know God is right, always right, right in what he does, right in what he decides, right always. He's right in his anger. He's right in his justice. He's right in how he deals with us. He's always right. And I might not understand it, and I might not like it, but he's always right. And when I come to that conclusion, when I recognize he's always right in how he deals with me, he's always righteous, man, that removes the pressure of trying to figure out, why did this happen to me? Well, if you understand, God dealt it for a reason, and there's a purpose in it for his glory, and you're good. It might not look good. It might not feel good, but he's right. If he's right, I'm wrong. I'm going to walk in his plan with peace. It's the reason why the Bible, which interprets itself in Genesis, Joseph says to his brothers, hey, you meant, past tense, you meant evil against me. You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Wait, 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 whoa, 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 Joseph. Are you saying when your brothers pushed you into a pit, and you were falling, and you hit the ground hard, they meant evil, you mean God meant that for good? You mean to tell me God meant that for good? Oh yes. You mean to tell me when they sold you into slavery, God meant that for good? Oh yes, he's right, he's right in his dealings, he had a plan, he knew that all of that would literally be like a domino effect, would take Joseph on a journey of spiritual development to develop confidence and character. And one day, oh, all of that which you took as evil, oh, God recycled it and made it good. Confidence in what he's doing. He is righteous. Let me make sure we understand what I'm saying. God is not defined by the term righteous as much as the term righteous is defined by God. See, there's a huge difference there. Yes, God is righteous. The Bible says it. But God defines righteousness. God is not measured by the standard of righteousness. God sets the standard of righteousness. The righteousness of God is evident in the way he consistently acts in accordance with his character. We see this in the life of Jesus. God is consistently godly. God is consistently godly. God is consistently and always right. 
Jesus' life is a perfect example how he dealt with every person. The measure by which he dealt with them was always righteous, always right. The anger that even rose up in Jesus, the Lord of love, the master of mercy, the God of grace, the anger was even righteous. He was right in everything he said, everything he did, his reactions. When he took an extra moment to deal with a woman who was maybe enslaved in some type of sexual immorality, he was right. And while everybody around him judged him, they were wrong. Our God is righteous. But the righteous one will always beget righteousness in his children. Did you get that? The likeness of God comes into his children's life. There will be a resemblance. This is what John means when he says, and you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Whoa, everyone who does righteous acts is born of God? Well, he's saying it's the evidence that you're born again, that your life is now intertwined with Jesus' life, you're abiding in him, you will do right. He says this over and over in this letter that we're covering. In chapter five, verse one, he says, whoever believes Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Wait, that's the qualification number one, to be born again, believe Jesus is the Christ. In chapter four, verse seven, he says, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. How do you know somebody is born of God? Well, they have biblical love, not just cultural love, where love, everything and everyone. No, the Bible has parameters on love, biblical parameters on love. In chapter three, verse nine, and chapter five, verse 18, he says, everyone born of God does not sin. What? People will take these verses out of context and go, wait, if you're born of God, you won't sin. No, that's not what he meant, because earlier in the letter, John already says, you're gonna sin, but no pattern of sinning. If I'm born of, of, of God, I won't enjoy sin. When I make a mistake, when I fail, when I'm sinning, there's that healthy conviction, and I come back. Finally, chapter five, verse four, whoever is born of God overcomes the world. This was interesting to me. I didn't know this even existed. I might have read it and probably just didn't see it. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 14. And it's God speaking through the prophet Ezekiel, and he mentions three men, three men out of all of the men in the Bible. And he's about to deal with the elders and the nation of Israel. And he's had it up to here. They are into idolatry. They are into adultery. They have forsaken God. And God says through the prophet Ezekiel, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in that land, they would only deliver themselves because of their righteousness, says God. So what was it about these three men that God highlights them for their righteousness. How were they living? What was their right living before God, their right standing? Well, often we get caught up in, how do I live righteous? What do I do? I'm gonna present to us, as we're almost drawing to a close, we have communion tonight. It's not necessarily what you do. Righteousness can be more about what you don't do. For example, what did Job not do? Job did not complain through unexpected suffering. Job said, the Lord gives, the Lord takes. Blessed be the name of the Lord, a.k.a. the Lord is right. The Lord is right. I don't know why this happened, but I'm not in the position to figure it out. He is right. He did not complain through unexpected suffering. You want to act righteous? Stop complaining and grumbling and questioning what it is that is going on in your life and trust the fact that God is righteous and he's allowed it for a reason. Job did not complain. What did Noah not do? Noah did not conform to the culture's sinning. While everybody around him was sinning and mocking and making fun, Noah followed God's voice, built this ark, in the midst of all the peer pressure, all the temptation. What did he not do? He didn't conform. Young ones in here, when we don't conform to the culture around us, we don't take our cue from the culture, we take our cue from the scripture. We take our cue from Christ. We don't fit into fads, we don't follow trends, we follow truth. And what did Daniel not do? Daniel did not compromise his godly standing. After the decree went out from Darius that nobody should be able to petition any other God except for him, Darius, for 30 days, Daniel went home, 
shot his windows open towards Jerusalem, got on his knees and prayed to his God. And then it tells us, it's like this sub note, like don't miss it. He did not hear about the decree and go, I'm gonna defy that. No, this was something Daniel did day by day. It tells us, sub note, this is what Daniel did. Like this was part of his DNA. This was part of his daily devotions. He only did what he always did. He did not compromise his godly standing. So righteousness is not us living up to the Christian name by the things we do morally, right? Because there's a lot of people that don't call themselves Christians that live moral lives. So living up to the Christian name, righteous, is something God does within us spiritually. God does the work. Peter would write about this. He said, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power, the Holy Spirit, has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The Holy Spirit, when we yield our lives over to him, he equips us to live lives of godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Don't miss that. How do I live righteous? Through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Abiding, staying at it, learning about him, living like him, trusting in him. He's not done. He says, by which you have been given to, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers, participants of the divine nature. Previous, your corrupted nature, but because of the Holy Spirit, divine nature. You have a new nature, a new DNA. And that new DNA translates into new living, right talking, right responding. Everything is right, chis, according to the word of God. How do you get that? You might say, man, I failed, I've blown it, I've come this far, what's the point of course correcting now? Well, that's the logic of many who continue down the pattern of sin, but it's never too late. You're never too far gone. You're never so entangled in something that's deep and dark. The Lord is waiting and he's knocking on your heart and he wants you to turn away from the sin and turn to his gracious and loving son. And it's the word repentance. And repentance is where we all need to begin tonight because repentance and true repentance, look at me, leads to a new resemblance. See, when I hold my new daughter in my hands, people say that she kinda doesn't look anything like me. <laughs> and I am grateful for that. No, some of you say she does. Some of you say she looks like Sarah. But the point is, because that's my child, there's resemblance there. And if we're children of God, there will be resemblance there. And it happens in a moment when I change my mind about my sin and I turn it back to the sun. And right there, the Holy Spirit will enter your life, enter your heart in a fresh and a new way and will begin to work things out. He gives an overhaul to your soul. He provides you with the divine nature as we just read. And Paul would write to the church at Ephesus, put off concerning the former conduct, that old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Repent, that you may put on, ready? The new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Hallelujah. Repentance. I don't know the last time you may have done serious business with God. Like you've done serious soul searching before God. You know, when you leave here and you get home, it might be too late. You get caught up with the kids. You got to put them to bed. Maybe you have your daily, nightly routine. And then tomorrow begins and you're into the weekend. And then Monday starts and you're back in the routine of life. And you never really stop for a moment to do business with God, to have communion with God. We want to provide that space of grace tonight. You might have come in with a spouse or children, but I'm asking you to consider you're right standing with God right now. See, we're gonna, we're gonna sing a song. And we're gonna do communion differently tonight because 
I want you to contemplate the lyrics of the song as you hold the elements in your hand. See, the elements in your hand are reflective of the gospel. We know the juice or the wine is the blood and the wafer or the bread is the body. Jesus said that the bread was symbolic of his body broken and the juice or the wine was symbolic of his blood shed, right? Without the shedding of blood, Old Testament, there is no remission of sins, right? But the blood has been shed, which means your sin is in remission. The first line of the song talks about God preparing a table for us. Psalm 23, there's a table that you prepare for me in the presence of my enemies. Your body and your blood shed for me. Now, what's that got to do with communion? Well, as you're holding these elements, did you know there's an enemy out there accusing you of everything you've ever done? Yet God says, if you listen to him, you'll think you are what you did. But if you focus on my table, I'm gonna tell you who you are because of what my son Jesus did. And I'm gonna provide the elements symbolically for you to contemplate what it meant for Jesus' body to get broken for you and what it meant for his blood. Our God bled to prove his love. So we sit together at this table and every time the enemy tries to accuse me and try to remind me who I am and what I did, this is how I fight my battle. I don't defend myself. I don't respond. I don't try to convince the naysayers or the haters that I'm changed. I do business with my God. And I consider the elements that you're holding, that we are holding together, I'm asking for nobody to stand, but as they lead us, that you would just listen to the lyrics, that you would begin to thank God for his redemption. Let me pray. Father, we're gonna do business with you right here, right now. Lord, we give you access to search our hearts, our souls, that we would remember your body broken, battered, beaten, bloody. And as that blood shed on Calvary's tree, as it hit earth, you redeemed all of mankind. You reconciled us back to yourself. So we wanna to abide tonight. We wanna to stay in this moment connected to you that we would have confidence knowing you're coming back and that your righteousness would literally be projected in our character to a world around us. Father, thank you for this moment as we pray. Think about this. Nobody partake until I come back out. There's a table that you prepared for me In the presence of my enemies It's your body and your blood is shed for me This is how I fight my battle There's a table
the bread, that body broken. Jesus said, every time you do this, do so in remembrance of me. In other words, do this to bring me to you, that you would have an awareness of my love for you. So I wanna invite this assembly as you take of this body that you would consider your right standing with the Father, purchased fully, completely by the Son. Father, we take this bread, symbolic of your Son's body, and we do so humbly. Let us take. Likewise, in the very same manner, Jesus engaged his disciples. He talked about the wine. He said it was his blood. They had no idea what that meant. But after the cross and after the tomb, the Holy Spirit began to bring into remembrance the things Jesus said. Can you imagine what went on in their hearts when they knew that that was the very act according to the Old Testament scriptures, symbolically and prophetically speaking of a lamb that would be slaughtered and that process is brutal. And it all made sense that Jesus Christ had did that very act and that sins would be forgiven forever. So I don't know who you are and you came in tonight doubting whether or not God loves you, whether or not he's actually forgiven you from the messes of your past. What we're holding in our hand is how we fight our battles. So I wanna invite this assembly to partake, to drink of the cup, remembering you are forgiven fully, freely, and forever. What'd you drink? Now I'd ask this assembly to stand with us. We're gonna sing verse two. I challenge, I charge as a minister of the truth that you would sing as if Jesus was here physically. How would you sing if your king was right here with you? Is he worthy of your praise? Is he worthy of your humility, your surrender? If that's true, then what are you gonna do about it? Let me pray. Father, I thank you again that we can commune with you, that there's not this wall of separation built by our sin. It wasn't too big to keep you from us, you tore it down. And we walk through this valley, the shadow that death looms over us, but we know death will have no victory, it has no sting, it has no say. We claim it, we believe it. This is how we fight our battles. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. As a church, we believe it's our responsibility to connect our community to Christ. So, if you've enjoyed the message today, then we'd like to invite you to share it with your family and friends. We'll see you next week.